Do you remember when I built OpenDog version 3 and I designed cycloidal drives? There's 12 of them in there and it's still going strong. The motors are brushless motors controlled by O-Drives and I've got some more projects coming up this year using the new O-Drive S1 kit which you'll see in the next few months. The great thing about OpenDog is its agility. It's got 10 to 1 reductions on the motors which means it can move pretty fast and the joints are back drivable so it can absorb load. I want to build some much bigger machines though, which are probably going to move much slower and also want to make the designs accessible. So all my designs are actually open source, including OpenDog and I publish STP or STEP files, which can be loaded into any CAD and actually edited rather than just meshes. And also all of the code on GitHub. So if you'd like to support me on Patreon or YouTube channel membership, then check that out. Patrons and members get access to um, all the videos up to a week early and I've stripped out most of the ads apart from the ones for 3D printing consumables, the 3D printers, that sort of thing and also Discord benefits. So in this video, I'm gonna design a cycloidal drive using a DC brushed motor that already has a gear head on it. And if that goes well, then basically I'm gonna use that in some bigger projects that are gonna come out this year, probably in the summer. So in a couple of projects I've built with similar motors, I save space and I put this motor inside the wheel hub. So the first bendy tank I did, that worked really well and saved loads of space. But what if we could do this with a cycloidal drive? What if we put this inside the cam that actually turns the cycloidal discs? The idea is to make something quite big and chunky here. So we've got quite a lot of parts to print to both mount that motor in the middle, hold the motor, and of course all the cycloidal parts. This is the cam which has got lots of support material around it because it's got overhangs for the offsets to put the bearings on. And here's the cycloidal disc, which is actually really big, and there's going to be two of them. So just a quick ad from my 3D printing sponsor. Thanks to Lolzbot 3D Printers for supporting my channel with 3D printers. It makes it much easier to get all the projects done on time when I've got quite a few printers, as you may have seen in some of the other videos. Here's a big arm that's going to go on the outside, which we'll be using for torque testing, hopefully. And yeah, a bunch more parts getting printed, some mounts and other stuff like that. Thanks to 3D Fuel for the filament for this project, you can now get 10% off at 3dfuel.com with my special code and link and I'll get a small commission. So here's the inside of where the cycloidal discs run, so this thing has 21 pegs on and we'll talk about the ratios in a moment, and I've got a big handle which we're actually going to clamp the thing down with or use to test torque. So I'm just going to glue that on and pop it in, it's a pretty tight fit, so that should be just the same as if it was all printed in one piece. This is designed to have a lot less bearings in than the last cycloidal drives, but there's still quite a few bearings, so thanks to Simply Bearings for sponsoring this project. The cycloidal discs have a bearing in the middle, and I've basically made those cycloidal discs in two halves, so they push together and encapsulate that bearing basically in the middle. So if we turn it around to the right orientation, the two halves screw together, and that means that that cycloidal disc can rotate freely. So with one of those fitted inside the inner thing, I put a bit of tape on so we can see where it is. And if we rotate that disc around 20 times, then it should come back to the beginning. And that's because we've got 20 lobes on the disc, which are those lumps on the disc basically, and 21 pins on the outer. So every time we rotate this, we get a 20th of a turn. So 20 turns gives us 20 to 1, and that means the cam goes around 20 times and the disc goes around once. So here's a close look at that motor, it's a Gimson Robotics motor with a gear head which is 99.5 to 1, so pretty beefy. On 12 volts it does about 60 RPM, so one revolution a second, which is not too bad. These do go all the way down to a 369 to 1 reduction, but I want to put all of the load on that shaft anyway, which is only 10 millimetres. I've put a collar on here so that we can mount some bearings on, and of course those cycloidal discs and the cam can rotate on the outside. So we've got a bearing and a collar to hold it in place, and another bearing and another collar. And that should mean that we can mount something on there quite nicely and put the motor in the middle. Here's the cam, which has got all of those offsets that I printed with support material, and that's so we can hold two bearings for those big cycloidal discs. There's also a shaft in with a keyway and a grub screw to fix it onto the motor. And as you've guessed, the motor fits right into the middle there, and those bearings are so that that cam rotates smoothly around it. It's a bit of a push to get it through the 10mm hole in the end. You can see there's a keyed shaft that's going to fit in there, so this is just a standard piece of 4mm key, and then there's a grub screw and a captive nut so I can screw that in and hold it in place and it won't slip off the motor. So let's just tighten that up. So now my cam rotates around the motor. Obviously I've had to leave some sticking out so that I can actually hold the motor, otherwise we won't be able to do anything with it because the mountings are inside the cam. And now as you'd imagine those cycloidal discs go on with those big bearings which is why they're so big and why the holes in them are so big. And that gives us our two rotating cams 
with another collar to hold them in place on the back and the front. And to hold all the collars on, there's two retainers which screw onto the end of the cam, both on the back and the front with three screws each, and that holds everything in place and stops the cams falling off. If I power that up, then we get this rather chaotic motion of these cams spinning round, but if I put my hand on it and stop them spinning, then we can see that they make this walking motion, and those are going to walk around the inside of the main casing, as we demonstrated earlier with just one of the cams. So this is looking pretty good, it's a pretty good motion. So now we've got to mount this inside this, and have it run perfectly in the middle. There's only one bit of the motor sticking out to mount it right in the middle, so I've made this clamp that goes around it, and that's going to hopefully hold the middle and all of the cams right in the middle of the outer casing there with those pins in. So the only thing to mount it onto is the motor itself rather than the gear head, because the gear head mountings are in the middle of the cam. So I've got some studding that bolts all the way through, I've tried to make this as sturdy as possible to hold it in the middle. So here it is, it seems to run okay actually with the motor on the back, through the middle of those cams, mounted with this bracket, and now we can see those cycloidal discs walking round the inside of those pegs with their lobes fitting and everything's looking pretty good actually. I don't think that's going to have too many problems. So pretty happy of how this has worked out so far. What we need to do now of course is harness the motion of those discs and get one rotating output. And to do that we've got this thing which has a bunch of studding bolted on and a load of bearings and those bearings are going to fit inside the holes in the cycloidal disc and allow to harness the output basically. So I've got a bearing in the back of that as well which again fits onto that collar on the whole assembly. So that should keep everything located centrally. It's a bit of a wiggle to get it in and get those bearings through and get them oriented in the discs okay. But that's all we need to do really is mount that on there and mount the whole thing together. And then everything should run on one central axis and that should be the basic principle of our cycloidal drive. So that seems to be running all right from that side. So we put the motor back in and the outer casing in. So all we need to do now is put the front on, which again has a bearing that fits onto the middle of that cam. And then this piece attaches to kind of a base and the back and everything's in one piece. So that's all going to be bolted up with some nice bolts and screwed onto the base. So there's our motion and we can see the outputs turning okay. Although it looks a bit like that casing's flexing in a rather weird way, which wasn't planned. So yeah, I don't know if you can see as the cycloidal disc is touching it, it's actually causing the casing to flex rather badly. It looks like it's all gone a funny shape. It's also making a really bad labouring sound, so that's not too good. And uh, yeah, you can see the whole thing twisting as those discs are walking opposite each other, and you can see it stretching the gap between the handle. So that's really not very good at all. So I've run this a few more times and what's actually happened is the motor started to slip out and the discs are popping out the other side. And that's because we're really only gripping that motor by the back of the motor because all the actual proper mountings are well inside the mechanism. So this isn't really a very good plan. Well the disc ran okay on its own and it seems to be toleranced okay and basically the measurements it should be in the CAD. Um, I think the problem is mainly that we haven't mounted the motor very well because there's hardly anything to grab it by and you know the label's worn off a bit there where it slipped so that's not really a great solution I hadn't thought this through really. These discs are running okay on their bearings there's almost too much space there so that's not the problem so I think probably it's just the way the motor's mounted and trying to keep everything central and aligned. So a slight redesign so that we've got the motor offset driving the thing with the belt drive rather than the motor being in the middle but everything else is the same we're just going to fix the casing down and put a lever on the output. But before we find out what's happening next, it's time for a quick ad from the video's sponsor, which is PCBWay. PCBWay is a one-stop shop for PCB manufacturing, assembly, and other types of manufacturing services, including contract manufacturing, all under the same roof. PCBWay manufacture all sorts of boards, including standard fiberglass boards, but also aluminium PCBs, flexible PCBs, and rigid flex PCBs, which are part rigid and part flexible. PCBWay also provides CNC services, including online CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing and injection moulding. Their CNC machining services include a wide range of materials including aluminium, stainless steel and various plastics. PCBWay's 3D printing services include SLS, SLA, DLP, FDM and more in a variety of materials. Check out the PCBWay website to browse through a variety of finishes and get a quote.
Check out the PCBWay Shared Projects section. This is a community of user-submitted projects with PCB schematics and parts listings. It's an open source platform for every maker to share their designs and all e-lovers can quickly get the files. They also have a module store which has all sorts of items for sale including Arduino boards, toolkits, robot parts and kits and sensor modules. Find out more now at PCBWay.com and I'll put that link in the video description. Right, let's build the next version of this. Here's the new cam, which has the same cam stuff on, but no motor in the middle this time. It's just got a drive shaft attached to it where the motor was, and then we'll just drive that with a drive belt from the motor offset. So as you'd imagine, the same discs go onto that and spin around. There's two of those with the collars and the retainers and everything to hold that in place. Yep, there's the other disc with the same arrangement of collar and retainer. So now we've got the two discs spinning around the cam. I've put them closer together this time as well, instead of having them so far apart, so the whole thing is much more compact. And that works in exactly the same way as last time. The outer part with the pegs on is now this piece with a base on to fix it down instead of the arm on it, but apart from that the geometry is the same. And of course those cycloidal discs and the cam go in the middle, and those again rotate perfectly well, so there's plenty of space in there, and nothing's getting flexed, and nothing weird is happening. So I'm pretty happy with that. There's almost too much space, in fact it's quite loose, so there's probably going to be some backlash in this design. There's a back plate which has got a bearing in which screws onto the back of that piece with the pegs on and then of course the whole assembly fits in the middle and the drive shaft on the cam fits right out of the back there so that we can drive it with a belt drive. It's quite tricky to get in and get those discs aligned but once everything's aligned then it runs perfectly well. So it's not constrained at the front yet but you can see that middle hub is actually running pretty much in the middle where the cam is and those discs are walking around perfectly well. That's where the drive shaft is going to drive the whole thing so we still get our 20 to 1, everything's the same ratio and everything's the same as it was before but it seems to be running much better so far. We haven't put this part in yet though so that'll be the true test to see what's really going on. Again we've got the bearings and a bearing in the middle and that's going to fit over that drive shaft and actually go in there behind the back plate. So we'll try and get that wiggled in, which should be quite a tight fit, but again, it's the same tolerance as before, so there's quite a bit of space. So, yeah, that's looking like it works okay, and everything runs on center, and if I rotate that piece, then all the bearings go around in the holes. So, again, the tolerances look okay, and everything runs okay from that side. So with the whole thing together, it still seems to run okay. There is a bit of wobble on that middle shaft, you can see, because there's nothing holding it at the front. But um, so far, so good. So I'm pretty hopeful, actually, that this is, this is running pretty well as designed in the first place, basically. Just wanted to look at backlash a little bit. I can turn the middle, not very much, in fact, before the outside turns. So, yeah, that's not too bad at all, actually. So here's the front, and that's again got those six bolt holes that are going to go on those big bolts, and it's got a bearing in the middle so it runs on that cam and everything's in the middle. So let's give that a shove, hopefully I can push that all the way down, and then that gets bolted on. So you can see, yeah, of course that's turning with all of those bolts, and it's attached to the cam in the middle to hold it. You can see that cycloidal action of that front disc at least. Obviously there's side to side wobble though because there's nothing holding this apart from the bearings on the back so there's nothing holding it on the front. There is a groove all around it though you might have noticed so instead of using a massive expensive bearing I'm going to use lots of little bearings running in that groove attached with bolts so I've got some shoulder bolts here so that bearing rotates around them nice and freely they've got a blank bit and then a threaded bit and that is going to screw all the way into the plastic and I've got around seven of those all around the circumference of the outer casing with those pegs on. So there is my poor man's big bearing that I've basically made with lots of small bearings. I put a little black arrow on that cam so you can see it turning and then you can see of course the outside goes round a lot slower so we've got our 20 to 1 reduction. We can also see how much backlash there is so how much can I move this before the outside turns. It's a little bit, it's probably 10 degrees or so but actually yeah not too bad for something so big and crude but actually I'm pretty happy with that for something so big and chunky. So it's a bit mysterious that this is running really well and really smoothly considering the last attempt where it looked like those cycloidal discs were flexing the casing and pushing it all over the place. So I think maybe it was just the motor mounting wasn't optimal on that version. I've used the same CAD here, I haven't re-toleranced the parts and all I've done is just change the mountings and put this back and front on so it's pretty mysterious what's happening but I'm really happy with how this is running anyway. The next thing of course to do is add the motor so I don't want to put the motor on the back here 
because then that makes it really long and the whole idea was to make this really compact. So we're gonna mount it to one side facing the other way and then we're gonna use a bell drive with one of these belts to turn that input and then we'll see how much torque and stuff we get out of it. So let's have a closer look at that motor spec again. This is 227 kilogram centimeters of stall torque at 18 amps. So that's actually quite a lot of torque already with that massive gear head on it. And that means with a one centimeter, that's 10 millimeter radius or length lever attached to the center of that rotation, it won't be able to lift 227 kilograms. It will stall at that point. But we shouldn't really be operating in that range. We should be doing about half or quarter for reliable operation. And compare that to a standard size servo. This is a Metal Gear, fairly good quality one. This is 20 kilogram centimeters. It's only a tenth of the torque. Here it is, so I've got that motor mounted on a piece that I've screwed on with a belt drive that's a one-to-one -one ratio at the moment, and I've got some idlers which hold that belt tight, hopefully. It's not quite as tight as I'd like, but it'll do for now, and we'll see how it goes. Right, let's power it up and see what happens. Well, it seems to be running great. Oh, I can't stop that with my hands, which is... Not that surprising considering how much torque there is. Ah! Ow. But yeah, I can't stop that with my hands either. So it's hardly surprising that I can't stop this with my hands after an additional 20 to 1. No, I still can't stop that. Be careful it doesn't hit the motor. No, that's still too powerful. Right, let's try this massive lever. Okay, yeah, right. So the belt is now skipping, so we need to tighten up that idler. Yep, so that belt is actually pretty loose, so we're gonna make bigger idlers and pull that belt in tighter, then hopefully the belt won't skip anymore. Yep, got rid of them and made some that are four mil bigger in radius, so that's holding the belt much tighter now. Right, let's give that a go. That's super strong, and um, I think it's gonna break the table or the plastic before it can't lift anymore. But let's put some mass on and see what we've actually got. So to make it easier to test than hanging hundreds of kilograms at a one centimetre radius, we're going to hang them at a hundred centimetres radius, which is one metre. And we're going to start with a four kilogram kettlebell that's hung roughly at one metre from the centre of rotation. And that lifts with absolutely no problems whatsoever. So that four kilogram mass hung at a hundred centimetre radius is 400 kilogram centimetres of torque, or just about 40 newton metres. It's the same as having 400 kilograms hung on a one centimetre lever. So let's try some more mass. Let's try eight kilograms. Still not too many problems there, it's labouring a bit, but it lifts it with no problems, although it does back drive now and make the whole thing go backwards when I turn the power off. So that is 800 kilogram centimetres or 80 newton metres. But let's try something heavier. I've got a 12 kilogram kettlebell. This one actually looks much bigger. Uh, that's because it's full of lighter material. So that lifts it with not too many problems. It is labouring quite a bit. I guess we're getting really close to the usable torque here. We don't want to get anywhere near the stall torque. So that's the 8 and the 12 together, so this is a nice round 20 kilograms at 1 metre. I'm sitting on the table here so it doesn't tip over. And yep, yeah, that's the sound of the belt skipping. So I can only really make the belt so tight, it's still a bit loose, but also the whole plastic assembly is bending and obviously pulling the motor closer, and that's why it's skipping. So there's not too much we can do about that. But on the whole, it still seems to be running absolutely fine, everything else is in one piece and nothing is broken. So those discs are fine, and with all those bearings, everything should be quite tough, really. These motors also come in a 19.2 to 1, so pretty much five times quicker. So we could have a motor going quicker on the input, and then use maybe a 3 to 1 belt reduction going to the cycloidal drive, and we could get more velocity overall for some projects. I'll be publishing all the CAD for this as open source as with all the other projects, and it's a solid model you can load into CAD and use and edit for your own projects.